It's time for the VolQuest podcast, where we dissect the biggest news items of the week. Good Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to the Smoky Mountain Organics VolQuest.com podcast. And again, thanks to our good friends at Smoky Mountain Organics for their continued support of the podcast and VolQuest.com. they got four locations to serve you, Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge, Sevierville, and of course their location in Knoxville on Kingston Pike, just across the street from Trader Joe's. That's Smoky Mountain Organics. You can check them out online at SmokyMountainOrganics.com. With Rob Lewis and Austin Price and Brent Hubs, we got a lot of things to get to in this podcast. It's a big week for Tennessee basketball. The Tennessee baseball team sets a record for attendance for any three-game set in school history. Josh Heupel's looking for a position coach on the football field as spring practice is right around the corner and recruiting getting ready to get cranked back up as well. Let's start with the Tennessee basketball team, Rob Lewis. They did not get a great whistle uh, in Arkansas. Um they come back this week going to Missouri tonight. Uh, and I think an interesting matchup from the standpoint of Missouri is not very good. They played a bunch of close games, haven't been able to figure out how to win. And then obviously the big game coming up this weekend at home. Your assessment of Tennessee basketball last week, you, you had the Kentucky game pegged right. I think you had the Arkansas game pegged right. Anything surprise you about Tennessee on the hardwood last week? Well, I mean, maybe a little surprised at how bad they were offensively at Arkansas, but as far as the outcome, no. I mean, I think we all – I think me and AP both predicted a split while, while Mr. Negative predicted an 0-2 week for, for the Vols. You talking about for, me? For last week. But, I, but I thought, again, I'm not surprised at the outcome. Again, a little surprised that they played so poorly. But, I mean, I thought that was going to be a really tough game for Tennessee to win. On, on the front end, just because, I mean, we know what it's like to come in here to Thompson Bowling and, and, you know, when it's when it's shaking in the rafters, and that's certainly the way it was at Arkansas. I mean, that fan base, when, when they have a, a product on the floor that, that you know, they appreciate that's winning, that, that fan base is as good as anybody in the league. And, and that was a madhouse on Saturday. And, again, yeah, I mean, Tennessee got a bad – I mean, you, you could say they got a bad whistle. I mean, I really thought the one – the most egregious one I thought was the one, the offensive foul call on Santiago on the baseline, that charge. Kennedy's, you know, those two charges I, I thought could have gone either way. But the one right before halftime with, with three seconds left and you drive, you, you just got to be smarter than that when, when you have two fouls. It was it was coupled with that, Rob, and, and then the, the egregious no call on the Arkansas guy standing four feet out of bounds, jumping and throwing the ball into Joe Sy and saying it's Arkansas's ball. <laughs> yeah. But at, at the end of the day, when you shoot 27% and, and go 4-22 from three-point range for 16%, I, I really don't have any interest in hearing about the referees. Yeah, yeah that's, I, fair. I, that's fair. I point. don't disagree with this. And, and I think the biggest thing is, you know, if you had told anybody three weeks ago, three weeks ago, not 10 days ago, three weeks ago, that you're going to be in a one- or two-possession game on the road at Arkansas under eight minutes to go in the second half, and you're going to have to have Jemai Meshack and Jonas Adu on the floor, you would have taken that 100 out of 100 times, right? I mean, I mean, yeah. look look where this team look where this team has been and come from. This loss is not a big deal. Tennessee still doesn't have a bad loss on their schedule, and if they can avoid the Georgia or Missouri games and, and win both those, they won't have a bad loss on their schedule. No, they've lost seven games, all seven to to rank teams rank teams at the time. Alabama and LSU no one ranked, and all on the road or in a neutral site game like with Villanova. And Texas Tech, and again, I mean, I I know that it, it may be the vocal minority, but I mean, you hear fans just going nuts about how Tennessee played. You know, the, the sky's falling; they're they're terrible. I mean, and I wrote this today in three, two, one. I mean, do you the Tennessee fans think Kentucky is an awful basketball team because they came in here and got dominated la last Tuesday night? I I don't. I think Kentucky's one of the five or six best teams in the country, and you know, I think Tennessee's a good basketball team, and. Nothing that happened in Arkansas changed that. I mean, it's hard to win on the road in college basketball, especially against quality opponents. Yeah, and, and Tennessee's obviously been awesome at home. Uh, that they're they've been at best five hundred on the road, probably a little under five hundred at road venues. I, I guess Rob, if I'm going to play my my classic negative slant as, as AP, and you like to to throw out there from time to time, how is it that? Uh, Jonas and Fulkerson can go for, what, 19 against Kentucky, 
with post players. And I'm still in your numbers from the three, two, one, by the way, I think it's 19 you wrote against Kentucky in the paint, but they're, the post players were a non-factor against an Arkansas team. That's not as physical and not as that does not have the same post presence as, as Kentucky yeah. has. I mean, Hubber, I don't have an answer for you. I mean, it's the, the John Fulkerson mystery just continues to baffle me. I mean, I, I mean, I love the kid. Tennessee fans love the kid. I mean, you're not going to find anybody who cares more about Tennessee than, than he does represents the university. But I mean, for him to, you know, go for 14 points against a, a pretty stout Kentucky front line, the best, you know, best inside player in, in the in the conference in Shib- in Shibwe, and then not hit a shot. I mean, take two two shots and, and miss both, and get, hit two free throws at Arkansas five days later. I mean, I just can't wrap my head around it. And Tennessee, I mean, they don't need him to be huge, but he he can't be, he can't be a no show against good teams. They're seven and one, I think seven. It's either seven one or eight and one in games where he scored double digits, and the only loss was an overtime against Texas Tech. When he had ten, they, I mean, they've beaten Kentucky, they've beaten Arizona. Um, he just it, it makes things really tough. I mean, it's a guard oriented team. That's not going to change. They're going to get most of their production from out there, but you've got to have some kind of a presence inside. And it, it's not fair to ask Jonas Adu to be that. Brandon Huntley Hatfield is clearly not ready. Eurosh is is what he is. I mean, and, and Fulkerson a, a six year super senior who two years ago was the second team All SEC player. I mean. To me, the burden pretty clearly falls on him. And he's in the twilight of a college career. I mean, that, that his his days are his days are numbered on the college basketball court. Um, so it's Austin. It's now or never, right? I mean, it, it's. I mean, you. There's no point in waiting on anything at this at, at this point. The juncture. You got a month, a month and a half of, of basketball left in your college career. Well, I think what you what, what you know to Rob's point. I think what you're going to see is is you know some nights Fulgerson's going to be 14 and and like he did against Kentucky or, or 20 plus like he did against Arizona. And then other nights he's just going to totally disappear and get you, you know, one point and two boards and, you know, four fouls and, and never factor, you know, I mean, I just don't think you can count on him to be consistent at this point in the, in the game. I mean, I think Tennessee's got to be content with knowing that, Hey, he may be really good one night and then he may not be anywhere to be found the next. And it's, it is what it is. And, and, you know, hopefully, you know, when Tennessee needs him in crunch time and big games, he'll find the magic that he found against Arizona, that he, that he showed sparks against Kentucky and hubs, anybody, you know, you're over there like, oh, you know, you and Rob, you know, Rob, I just want you to know, we went and we, we did a meeting earlier today uh, about, you know, you know, some ideas for a potential event down the line and hubs only come in with the potential, you know, flaws to every idea kicked around. So like, you know, Typical negative Nelly, you know, as, as, as he is, I mean, it's, it's quite, quite remarkable. It's my job to make things better. AP I'm trying to make <laughs> things better. Okay. That's, that's what I, that's what I'm doing. Sometimes you got to point out some potholes to make things better. Ultimately, Rob, how scary is it? If Austin's notion is true. And I think we would agree. I mean, I think you just indicated this as well, that, that John Fulkerson is going to be up and down. How hard is it for this team to make any kind of real run in the postseason if it's that yo-yo act with, with him in the post? Well, I think it's really hard. I mean, I don't see them – I mean, right now, I mean, if if, if it started today, would Tennessee be a, a three-seed or a four-seed? Either way, they're play, assuming they win their opening round game, they're playing somebody tough on Saturday or Sunday that first weekend. And if he's – you know, has a two-point, two-rebound game, I don't see them beating, you know, a five or a six-seed unless it's one of those games where they're just, you know – 14 to 27 from three point range. Yeah. Just you scorching just can't hot. Count on. Yeah. Just, just scorching hot. And again, I, you know, I, I think you wrote this. I know you wrote this in the three to one. I mean, the loss is not a big, is not a big deal in, in the grand scheme. When you start looking within the framework of the loss, there's a couple of things that are concerning. That is how do they again score when they don't shoot it well from the perimeter? It's a question I asked you in December, and we're sitting here heading into March, and it's the same question surrounding this basketball team, but because they just have not found any kind of offensive consistency in the post. Yeah, and and that's where, you know, losing Olivier, I mean, you think a guy that's averaging 8.6 points a game is, is not a, you know, huge, enormous loss, but if he gives you eight points at Arkansas on Saturday, that's a, that's a pretty big deal, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, you're, Certainly. That's, that's a huge deal. And I mean, I, 
I thought Olivier was coming on, and he was averaging close to double digits in, in league play and had really come on in, in the last three weeks. And I just – I mean, I think it's going to be tough. I think it's lowered the ceiling. I mean, Jonas Adu is exciting. He, he's got a world of potential. I mean, I, I like what he brings to the floor. I think he needs to play more. I think he is going to play more. But, you know, he's not a third-year player that's, you know, been through the ground like Olivier has. He doesn't bring the same kind of physicality. Now, he brings things that Olivier does not. But, you know, he doesn't – he doesn't bring the – you know, not that Olivier was an explosive scorer, but he, a lot of nights he was pretty darn efficient and, and was getting better. Yeah. And especially, you know, on those nights when, you know, if Fulkerson has two points, if Olivier gives you nine, that's, that's significant. And I don't know that, you know, there's another guy. I mean, I just don't think that guy exists. Ever. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and, and Olivier was the guy who, who could shoot a 15 foot jump shot from the baseline. He could hit from the elbow and, and, and Jonas looks like a guy who it's going to be an offensive putback if he's going to score. That's going to kind of be his where his offensive game is right now. So it is hard to make up for a, a night, you know, production wise when when John Fulkerson is a non factor on the offensive end. Let's talk about Missouri tonight. Um, a, a Missouri team, Rob, that's just had a hard time finding their way. But really, this is all the pressures on Tennessee in this game tonight, even though it's on Missouri's home floor. I mean, Tennessee's got to take care of business. And as you mentioned, winning on the road is not easy. Yeah, I, I mean, I like Tennessee's chances in this one a lot. Um, you know, M- Missouri will definitely, I mean, I, I think definitely be able to, to ugly it up, you know, to make it a game that's played in the 50s or, or you know, the 60s. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me. But, man, they are, they are really limited offensively. I mean, I think if Tennessee brings the same level of defense that, that we are accustomed to seeing them play with, uh, I, I think Tennessee just – you know, can kind of muck around in a slugfest and win it. I mean, Missouri's the lowest scoring team in the SEC, 64 points a game. Um, they're the worst three-point shooting team in the league in, in SEC play. Really struggled from out there. Don't have a lot of guys that, can, that, that you have to, you know, respect from out there. I think Tennessee really packs it in, makes it tough on them. Um, Again, as long as Tennessee's defense shows up, I, I think the Vols will be enough to, to outscore a, 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 a Missouri team that, that really struggles. And a Missouri team that's played its third game in five days thanks to the, the COVID makeup with Mississippi State. I think that'll be a factor. Yep, that's a good point. Uh, Auburn is obviously on the horizon, and it's going to be a madhouse for, for that affair. Um, Auburn loses to, to Florida. Rob and, and, a, and a head scratcher. What 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 do you make of that? What do you make of Auburn right now? Well, I mean, I th- I think Auburn's really good. I'm not going to take anything away from them at, at all, but uh, I, I think they've shown shown some chinks in the armor here in these you know their, their last two road games, and those aren't easy places to play. And everybody's going to be up for them now, but but they're expecting that. I mean, they and and they lost. I mean, let's not they lost two one point games essentially to Arkansas and, and Florida. So it's not like you know that they've completely fallen off, but I, I, it's going to be a really tough matchup inside for Tennessee with, with Jabari Smith and Walker Kessler, but I don't think Auburn's got the guards that they've had in, in the past. I mean, they're, they're good. I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and say they aren't good, but um, they're, I, I don't think they had the, the backcourt talent that they've had in the recent past. Now, you know, maybe they're so much better in the front court that that, that offsets it, but you know, I, I don't think KD Johnson is the same kind of, you know, guy that, that they've had back there in the past. They're not the same kind of three-point shooting, you know, mad bombers that they have been in the past. I think their best guy shoots like 32, 33% from outside. And, yeah, all that said, Jabari Smith averaged about 30 points a game in two games last week, so he's going to be a load. But uh, I think with the environment that, that Tennessee is going to throw out there Saturday, it's going to be, as you said, it's going to be a madhouse. Um, you know, I think fans, certainly the students, had a blast at the Kentucky game and they're, they're going to be ready to replicate that. Um, they're going to look forward to replicating that. So um, I, I like, I like Tennessee's chances. I wouldn't go out and bet the house on it or anything like that, but I think Tennessee's in a pretty good spot here against an Auburn team that has, you know, faltered in, in their last two road tests. All right. For both of you guys, how many teams are you put in the league? Are you putting in the tournament right now? You got four teams that are clear cut in my opinion that have separated themselves, Auburn, Kentucky, Tennessee, Arkansas, then you've got a pack of got teams that I don't know what, what they are who, are who are all hanging around the 500 mark. 
Um, what, what do you think about tournament chances for this league? Are they losing bids in the passing in the passing weeks here, or are there going to be some 500 type teams get into this thing, or are there going to be a handful of teams on the on the bubble heading into the SEC tournament? Well, I think Florida, if they can build on what they did Saturday with the win over Auburn, I think they have a chance to play themselves in. I, I think as of today, I think SEC gets seven in, but I'm counting Florida. But they, you know, they've got to finish strong. They have, you know, they just got the win over Auburn. They've got another big chance this week with Arkansas coming to Gainesville. You know, I would call that a 50-50 game. Um, and then they have what, you know, two very winnable games at Georgia, at Vanderbilt. If they, you know, if they get those two, if they win at home against Arkansas, I, I like their chances. They also have Kentucky coming in. I don't know that, you know, they just beat Auburn, so I guess they could beat Kentucky and Gainesville. But I, I kind of like the Cats in that matchup. But I, I think Georgia, if they get, if they can get three wins here in their last four games, with, that's at home against Arkansas, at Georgia, at Vandy, at home against Kentucky, then I think they sneak in. And, man, I mean, I, I've got LSU in right now, but good gracious. <laughs> they, they've done everything they can to play themselves out of it here, here in the last month. And Bama, you know, they're, they're, all these three teams we're talking about are seven and seven in the league right now. But Bama, man, wins over Gonzaga, wins over Baylor, a win over Tennessee. I, I mean, I think they get in, but I, again, they can't, they can't just waltz down the stretch. But they, they've got two pretty – I don't know. I wouldn't call South Carolina easy at home, but that's one they'll be favored in. Texas A&M at home and Vanderbilt on the road and at LSU. If, if Bama goes two and two in those last four, I, I put them in. Okay. I've, yep. I've got six, and then when Georgia wins the tournament, they'll be seven. <laughs> <laughs> it is life in the SEC, that, that's for sure. Um, oh, wait, there's no tornadoes in Tampa. <laughs> Never mind. Speaking of life in the SEC, Tennessee's on the road in the challenging life against Missouri later tonight. We'll have certainly coverage of, of Tennessee and the Tigers and in full coverage of Tennessee and Auburn this weekend as well, as it is a big week on the hardwood for Tennessee's basketball team. We'll see if they can find any kind of consistency in the post. We'll see if they can shoot it uh, well enough on the road at Missouri tonight. You know they're going to shoot it well at home because they have all season long. The Tennessee football program is looking for a position coach. Um, Austin, why is Cody Burns no longer on Josh Heupel's staff? You know, I had to kind of broke it out into hives most of the month of February with no news. All those hives went away, man. It feels like old times. Maybe we got a coaching <laughs> search. You know, I mean, listen, I'd rather be trying to find a wide receivers coach than an O-line coach. And I definitely would rather be finding a position coach, period, over an offensive coordinator. So with Matt Luke's departure from Georgia and, you know, Kentucky's OC headed back to the NFL of the Rams, you know, no, none of the three programs in the East are, you know, real happy about having to make a late February coaching hire or early March coaching hire. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. Um, you know, you got names that are being tossed out there. I mean, would Tennessee go down the road of a David Johnson who was here? Would they look at a Trooper Taylor who was here many moons ago? Chum in the water. Chum in you know, the water, Hubbard. Would, you know, would they look at, you know, uh, at Callaway from, from North Carolina? I, I, I don't know. I think at this stage, Brent, don't you have to look at either guys you have ties to mm -hmm. or, or – Coaches that are in that Derek Dooley type third year situation where like they're like, man, I'm almost I'm good for another year, but I really need to get out of here because this place ain't gonna be here a year from now. You know, and you know, just like you saw those coaches defecting from Dooley staff, you might could steal somebody, which is you know, David Johnson potentially at Florida State. You know, what are they gonna do down there if they no show again? You know, I mean, everybody rumors Mac Brown to be out of there you know, sooner rather than later into retirement again, you know, I mean, I, I just think you're not going to go out and get somebody off a high end team. So you've either got to go down a level or you've got to go with someone at a big name school that potentially is going to be making a change after next year. Or I got a big name school. that has got a new boss and he's spent the last few weeks with him and maybe he doesn't feel completely comfortable yeah. with his new, with his new boss, which I don't know any of those names out there, but that's always something that, that you're potentially looking for. Rob, I'll you jump in here too. If you're Josh Heupel, what, what's the, what is this code? Is, is this about a, is this a recruiting hire? Is, is that your first it better be. If you're Josh Heupel. It is for me. I mean, it wasn't, if he wasn't Cody Burns primarily responsible for in-state. Well, he, he had, he had 
west of Nashville before you get to Memphis. But they had moved him out of the state, which okay. tells you tell should tell everybody all you need to know. Yes. I think that's I think that's a bold statement. They moved Mike statement. Eckler into that area. And don't um, you think? I mean, I mean, everybody talks about how much better the wide receivers got last year. I mean, I, it, it's it's impossible to answer this one hundred percent, but. Don't you think that a lot of that had to do with the system and not anything Cody Burns brought to the table? Um, I mean, I don't want to just say that Cody Burns brought nothing to the table. No, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying him. that either. No, no, I know. I, I, I think it's 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 kind of part Cody Burns, part system, part better quarterback play. I mean, how much does that play into it? I mean, we saw, you know, the same guy for four years, and all of a sudden it was an, an, a new quarterback that everybody just kind of bought in and believed by, you know, believed in. So I think it's a combination of several different factors, no doubt. Um, so, I mean, like, again, I don't think you have to go out and get some Spengali developer of talent. Um, I think you need a recruiter more than anything else. And I, that that's my opinion. Uh, you can't have a lame duck coach you can't develop, but you, you'd love a guy that's solid and then a, a, just a total butt kicker in recruiting. How quick does Josh Heupel got to go? With it, with I, hire. If you don't have a hire in place by the junior day on March 5th, to me, that's that's not good. I, I think you need to have somebody in place and in the building before next uh, the March 5th junior day. See how fast Josh Heupel wants to go. We'll see what names show up on the list, who he's got a tie to, who might have interest in this job. I think this job is certainly a more intriguing job than some others are out there just because of what Josh Heupel did in year one. Uh, the fact that Tennessee has an administration that seems solid up above them at this point. Uh, there's a lot of stability at Tennessee, um, which should make Tennessee a more marketable uh, program out there for um, a, a position coach. Uh, the, you know, I, I don't think Josh Heupel is rattled by, the, by this move. I know he's talked some about staff continuity, but I, I think he made it clear when he spoke at the, the Rotary Club a couple of weeks ago staff turnover is going to be just a part of the game. And um, Cody Burns obviously decided that the NFL and, – and I can't blame him for wanting to be in the NFL. I think the NFL is a better path in a lot of ways than the college game is with where the college game is right now. So uh, I can't argue with Cody Burns make, making that move, but I don't think Josh Heupel's rattled by coaching turnover because I think he anticipated some in the coming – maybe not this one right now, but I think, you know – he was kind of downplaying a little bit of the staff continuity stuff, I guess is what I'm saying, uh, at, at the quarterback club or at the uh, Rotary Club when he spoke a couple of weeks yeah, ago. And, and like, like AP said, you're not losing a coordinator. You know, you're not not losing your offensive line coach. I mean, it's – again, I don't, I don't want to say it's ideal at, because of the timing, but it's, it's, it's a lot better than what we have seen sometimes in the past. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a – you know, Kentucky's in a much different situation because – you lost your whole system. So who's going to come in and run a system with spring practice slated to start in just a couple of weeks at, at Kentucky with the offensive coordinator being gone? That's a much that's a much more challenging position um, in, in a challenging place for Stoops to be in than it is to play to replace a um, a position coach uh, the way Tennessee is having to uh, with Cody Burns' departure to uh, the National Football League. Um, Mike Eckler and some other staff members are, are traveling around. Mike Eckler's been in the NFL, not interviewing for jobs, but visiting with some NFL folks uh, about some special team stuff and about some defensive stuff. It's that time of year where coaches get out of the office or our staffs come in and they share ideas and, and bounce things off of each other as they, as they get ready for spring practice and, and get ready for that recruiting weekend that's coming up. That Austin continues to be a, a big weekend. Starts with quarterback. You're going to have a bunch of running backs in as well. It's an important weekend for Tennessee, that first weekend in March, two weeks before spring practice starts. Yeah, I mean, Tennessee would love to have Noah Rogers come in that weekend. They, they're going to have Justin Brown in that weekend. All the more reason to have a wide receiver hire before that weekend. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that, that list is going to continue to grow. Tennessee trying to continue to add more and more players in here that, that weekend and, and really just in the month of March in general. I mean, you know, you're really going to set up for that March 5th. And then after that, you'd love to get them there at the end of the month, you know, when, you know, spring practice has started. So you can, you know, have kids there for practice and show them how you coach. Yep. So we'll see what that list ultimately ends up looking like um, in a couple of weeks as it's always changing and, and, and moving around. As for the current team, continuing to go through 
uh, winter workouts and, and getting themselves ready for spring practice and, and moving forward in that way. So we'll keep you up to date on all the things going on uh, in the football world for sure. Rob, I forgot to ask you earlier, what, what do you think the Big Ten does um, with, 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 with Wisconsin and Michigan? With Good the gracious. I mean, I, I got to think Howard gets suspended. I don't know whether that's just for the rest of the regular season for, you know, includes the conference tournament. I mean, I don't, I don't think he loses his job over this unless, unless Michigan had seen something that made them think they wanted to move on and this is what they use. Um, but, you know, what, the one last year with, with Mark Turgeon in Maryland was not as bad, but it was, you know, it was above it, – it, it crossed the line. I mean, he didn't lay hands on or slap anybody. But, I mean, I just, you know, think about Tennessee's head coach and, you know, no, or no matter how fiery John Calipari gets. Or, so I just can't imagine either one of those guys ever, you know, getting – you know, crossing that line and, 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 and making a decision like that. And I asked Rick about it on Monday and he didn't condemn Jawan and I wouldn't expect him to, but, you know, he just, he kind of just said there were a lot of moments, you know, a few moments in his career as a young head coach that he wished he had back. But even with that, I mean, he never, he never slapped Dean Smith. No, they got called to the principal's office, but there was never any, any physical altercation. There's somebody, just, made, somebody made this point to me, Rob. I thought it was an interesting point. You had the situation in the Clemson game where you had just that horrific foul where, where the, the kid from Clemson who fouled the Duke player got a one-game suspension. How much different is this when you have a physical play like that that endangers the health and well-being of a player who got a one-game suspension versus two coaches doing this in the line as representatives of your university and, a, and of your program? I mean, I think it's way different. I mean, I think the Clemson move was a punk play, but you're still talking about a 20, 21 year old kid who's not getting paid millions of dollars to to be the face of your program, especially in a place like like Michigan, which is one of the most visible jobs in the country. I just, I, I don't think they're comparable. And again, I, I mean, I think that was a punk move by by the Clemson kid. He deserved to get suspended. I would have been okay with him getting suspended for more than one game, but you're still talking about a kid as opposed to a grown man who is supposed to be not only setting the example for his players, but representing your university in a class and professional manner. And I think that matters more at Michigan than it does other places. We'll see what the Big Ten does. We'll see what Michigan does. We'll see what Wisconsin does. Um, just as a, a fallout to that, that's so obviously not something you see every day. Lastly, something else you don't see every day, Austin Price, 39-degree weather. And there's 4,000 fans watching a Tennessee baseball team play in February. Uh, they set a record for attendance over a three-game set. Um, how impressive is it what Tony Vitello is getting done beyond wins um, on, the, on the diamond when you talk about the environment he's created um, in, in a stadium that's obviously not one of the better facilities uh, in the SEC? People just want to come and be a part of it, man. People are excited about it. The fact on the opening weekend, um, in the middle of basketball season, you had, you know, you know, that weekend of 13,566 fans. Um, you know, that first game I was there, it was cold. I don't get cold. You know this. I was cold. Um, you know, it was just windy and those metal um, porches out there in the left field you know, made my feet even colder. Um, it was, but the atmosphere is awesome. The fan, the credit to the students, man. I mean, they, you talk about a, a bunch of loud butt kickers. I mean, they were awesome from the jump. And I, and I'll acknowledge, I think a lot of that noise because they're pointed right at, you know, the, the porches, you know, come straight to the porches, but I mean, it was massively loud on a lot of just normal plays. I mean, um, you know, what he did this weekend against what is predicted to be a pretty solid Georgia Southern team that's predicted to finish pretty high in their conference. Impressive considering you started two true freshmen and then a Georgia Southern transfer, you know, and uh, Tennessee, it's a sweep. They played Tennessee Tech later tonight in what should be great weather for a Tuesday night before rain Wednesday and Thursday, um, you know, uh, and then potentially a lot of rain this weekend for that series with Iona. But Tennessee's got a chance to get off to a really good start here. Um, before they head down to 
uh, Minute Maid to play Texas and a few other quality programs down there in Houston. Yeah, AP, I mean, was I just was Hawk in midseason form on the grill? Was there any any early season jitters, or, or did was, Hawk, was it all Hawk, smooth? Hawk was trying to figure out how he can get stowed away in my luggage on my next golf trip. <laughs> that was basically what what Alan Sitzler was doing. Did, did, but he had the grill. He had the grill fired right. He was. I mean, he was a good host, right? Oh, Hawk's the man, yeah, and, 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 and 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 an unlimited legend that. That you know, really, you know, people can't uh, state you know all the good that he does for the kids over there on campus. I'd say what uh, I now give Tony Vitello credit. He is touching every layer of the fan base, from students to high end donors. Tony Vitello has done a terrific job since he's been here of touching all those people and making them feel apart. And hats off to the Tennessee students, not only in baseball but Rob Lewis. That they were they were terrific in a Tuesday night against Kentucky. You know they'll be terrific on a Saturday afternoon against Auburn as well, creating a home field advantage. Hats off to a bunch of college kids for uh, getting involved in that. And hats off to Tennessee's administration for kind of letting them go and letting them be college students and creating an environments in both of those uh, facilities the way they have the last couple of weeks. So uh, be a lot of fun this week. Lots of things going on. Lots of coverage at VolQuest.com. That's going to do it for this Tuesday edition of the Smoky Mountain Organics podcast for Austin Price and Rob Lewis. I'm Brent Hubbs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, everybody. You've been listening to the Ball Quest podcast every week here on Ball Quest.